Welcome to Film Studies with Michael. I am your host, Michael. After the spirited debate assailed the commentary section of my illustrious website over the videographic essay on the Flintstones in Vivo Rock Vegas, I trust we've all cleansed our palates in preparation for this week's entry in the Film Studies with Michael. I am most assuredly talking about the 1986 John Carpenter classic, Big Trouble in Little China, a film ostensibly about what happens when a western meets an eastern, and in most fascinating of fact, was originally envisioned to take place in ye olden times with Jack Burton's truck, which is stolen and sets off the events of our film, actually being a horse. True story. Now, this film had a couple of writers, including Gary Goldman and David Z. Weinstein, though this was the only film that Mr. Weinstein ever worked on as a writer, which is highly peculiar because he doesn't really have all too many credits in his repertoire at all. His partner, Mr. Goldman, is quite the opposite, with many films to his authorial credits, including Total Recall, Navy Seals, and Next. But, like, what is it? Like, I don't understand. He's like a Vegas dude. He's like a magician or whatever. He can, like, see into the... He's like, what? I mean, what is it? And then, like, the FBI tells him he's got to stop a nuke or something. It sounds revolting. No, you sound like Adele. You sh So, Next was directed by the man who directed Die Another Day in Triple X State of the Union. Sorry, what was I talking about? Back to Big Trouble. As I'm sure many of the patrons of this fine televisual program will note, Jack Burton is the protagonist of our story only by relative screen time, and by pure happenstantial luck, manages to best our villain with a knife to the head. But this is only possible because he's got the girthed loins for a woman he just met, and they're put in the same fairy tale esque predicament as our actual protagonist. Wang Chi, whom organizes a small army to partake in the rescue and further, even has the ability to fight off the substantial threat lingering before them. If you watch the film with this in mind, you will note that the agency of our story belongs entirely to Mr. Chi, Come on, Jack! and not, as the film's poster would attest, to Mr. Burton. And though this misunderstanding allows for some of the finest comedically inclined failing upwards you'll see in a film, well, Ever, it's worth noting that this misinterpretation of reality is what allows our story to reach any conclusion at all. In simplified terms, if Mr. Burton was not entirely convinced he was the hero of this story, he would not have successfully caught the knife at the end and violently overthrown the substantial threat that our villain David Lopin was wielding. In substantially slaughtered terms, it is only through Mr. Burton's myopic, arrogant, and wholly erroneous American exceptionalism that our story finds any conclusion at all. He wins because he accomplishes the impossible by simply attempting something no sane, rational human ever would. I mean, he spends much of the climax unconscious because he discharges his own firearm into an archway that subsequently renders him insentient. Everyone else believes Mr. Lopin is an unstoppable foe because they have the intellect to understand this to be true. Mr. Burton has no such intellect and in terms even he could understand, he's stupid. But he's stupid enough to win. And no one else is that stupid. So, by that metric, he's the only irreplaceable piece of our entire puzzle. You must see, you see the conundrum is most salacious. I mean, most. <laughs> the simplest way to prove this is to look at the beginning. The entire film is told in flashback, and Egg Shin canonizes Jack Burton as the hero by giving him credit for the whole ordeal. And then he uses some magic he doesn't actually use in the film that probably would have come in handy, but whatever! This launches us into the film proper, where we meet the real Jack, a man who basically bullshits everyone about how great he is at fighting, figuring things out, and basically living his life. He also has the most disturbing propensity to talk about himself in the third person. He's basically the Donald Trump of... Donald Trump. Eventually, we are introduced to Jack's one usable skill, his reflexes. And if I may, the impetus for our conflict comes at the airport when Wang's fiance, Mao Yin, is kidnapped by the Lords of Death Chinatown street gang and thrusts our heroes into an epic conflict. This is also the first time we as the audience notice that Wang is the person making all the decisions and Jack is just along for the ride. Because Wang, at this point, is the wronged party. Protagonist. Psychic. Oh, goody! Oh, so it's like Kevin in the Woods, right? Where the two people were like, Oopsie, doopsie, we're the backwards people. We're the, actually the other two. Oh, that's great. 
That's great. Oh, my life is so empty and meaningless. As they give chase, they end up in a massive street fight between two rival Chinatown gangs, and this is the first time the movie subverts our expectations by supplanting the expected result with the surprising one. Wang and Mr. Burton are surrounded by warring martial artist gangs in a quote-unquote Chinese standoff. Is that real Chinese standoff bullshit? I mean, it's gotta be fake, right? That can't be real. That can't be real. Anyway, Jesus Christ! <clears throat> Sorry. You see, your expectations are supplanted because you aren't expecting two Chinese street gangs to fight like American gangs. And that's our, that's what makes you a racist of the week. Then this shit basically turns into gangs of New York. Also, what's commendable about this movie, especially in 1986, is that the film actually cast Asian actors in a litany of non-white roles without whitewashing them for an American audience. A stupid practice we still manage to employ today. Because we're stupid assholes. Just like Jack Burton. Oh! Turn down the what this scene also gets us, because again, this entire film is seen only from Mr. Burton's perspective, is the idea that we are circling a much larger conflict, oftentimes simply running through the middle of a particularly insane fight with little to no explanation as to what's going on. We, the audience, never fully understand the context of this ancient mythological fight because we are only meant to understand what Jack does, which is not a goddamn thing. Of equal obtuseness is Kim Cattrall's character Gracie Law, a reporter trying to make sense of something much larger and much more complex than she is willing to acknowledge. Like Jack, she too becomes central to the story for no other reason than she won't stop picking at it. A Chinese girl with green eyes, according to the story, is quite impossible, which makes Mao Yin a central figure in completing a fated mythology, which is also never really explained outside of a David Lopin being a motherfucking wizard or what have you. What did you know? The reality of this is actually quite fascinating because there are, in fact, Chinese citizens that are born with green eyes. They reside mostly in a small village called Le Quan, and some of them even have blonde hair. Would you believe that? And this is equally unheard of in China. Most recently, through DNA testing, did they find out that two-thirds of their DNA had Roman Caucasian origin. You see, in 53 BC, Roman general Marcus Crassus was defeated by the Pathanians and was eventually beheaded in an area we now know as Iran. Some 150 of his soldiers wandered the area for a while, heading east for years only to be captured by the Chinese and founding the town of Lequan in 36 BC. Which makes Gracie's capture all the more ridiculous because Americans with green eyes aren't even that rare at all. I mean, my, my mom's got green eyes, so when I was a kid I watched this movie like every f day, right? I was constantly scared that my mom was going to be kidnapped by the Chinese triad and I had to like go rescue her, but I was a strapping straight mother G, you know what I'm saying? Of similar import is the fact that entire scenes are edited together in an effort to be as confusing as possible. To allow us to feel as lost as Jack is, rooms and magic are employed in unexplained and wholly unconnected ways. Wang and Jack are in an elevator that floods, leading them to another flooded upside down medieval torture chamber, only to smash cut to one of Lopan's three godlike mini bosses bringing the torture. But did you know that one of those godlike mini bosses was the basis for Mortal Kombat OG Raiden? Okay, hold the fuck. Now everybody knows that one, right? I mean, you watch this movie once and you wonder how Midway didn't get like sued or nothing, right? Like, I mean, it's not even soul. <laughs> You could also say that the mini boss whose superpower was inflation wasn't cool enough to make the combat cut. <laughs> it's copyrighted, don't steal that. Let's go back to subverting expectations for a moment because the dialogue in this film most always succeeds in dodging cliches at every turn, usually to maximum efficiency. Oddly, I found it quite reminiscent of Shane Black's work on Kiss Kiss Gang Bang. Oh dear lord, that's not the real title, right? Right? Oh, look at that! Dungeons and Dragons is in this fall. Oh, Jesus Christ! And there's that scene going into the climax where they all essentially drink ecstasy so they're not scared going into the massive battle in front of them. Which is also where the film loses its goddamn mind in all the best ways possible. American cinema did not have many films that treated the martial arts as the ballet it can be. But this film, ostensibly about a buffoon in a Walmart tank top, has a legit is martial arts, due in large part to Dennis Dunn as Wayne, is just a nibble.
So what does Big Trouble in Little China say about the American culture? Well, it's not good, I'm afraid. For genre filmmakers, I'd say my money is more on the poor Verhoevens of the world to be given credit for meaningful social commentary. But if we're at all honest with ourselves, Mr. Verhoeven's commentary can be summed up in the following. Police state bad. Nazis worse. She pretty. Of additional import, if you've seen Mr. Verhoeven's Hollow Man, then you probably need to take at least a couple of collegiate women's studies courses because... Holy shit. Now, where Mr. Carpenter succeeds in social commentary is showing Americans as brazen, arrogant, overly sensitive by virtue of their own egos, culture explaining to people of said culture, and generally just being an ignorant shit about everything. For my money, if you want social commentary from directors of this era, then Mr. Carpenter is your man, and Mr. Verhoeven is simply given credit because that's what everyone else is doing. Oh, don't even come at me with that Robocop shit. Oh, the media has dumbed us down to the point they can create a police. Oh, that's so inventive. Which is serviceable commentary in and of itself, but the reality that Robocop the film is blissfully unaware that its main character represents the exact police state that he's also fighting is an irony lost on itself. It's revenge porn, plain and simple. <laughs> And there we go, another episode of Movies of Mikey in the can. I know I went super strange with this one, and I sort of don't. Uh, care. Sorry. If you didn't like it, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought it would be really, really funny to go super, super highbrow like Masterpiece Theater with Big Trouble in Little China because that's the most ridiculous thing uh, ever. So there you go. I don't... I, I. If you missed my regular voice and you thought that British accent was horrible, you're, you're, you're probably right. As always, please share, like, and subscribe. Do all the YouTube things. Uh, we still need them, although you guys have been doing a great job lately. Keep it up. You guys are certainly helping make Movies and Mikey a much bigger show. I can tell that it's working because the number of illegitimate copyright claims against my channel has gone up exponentially. So there might be a little more time between episodes because I have to file a bunch of appeals. It's a whole thing. Anyway, let's get to voting. How about three choices? And they are... Nice. Oh, shit. What? Oh, okay. So Star Wars is on there. I just put Mad Max against Star Wars. Uh, see you next time. Don't kill each other in the comments. I, lo I love you.